No? But anyway, good evening. Good to see all of you. Hopefully everyone is uh, doing well. I'm sure some of you are like looking forward to Aaron, but you're stuck with me. So you guys are stuck with me, but you're going to get Aaron next week uh, if the Lord wills. Uh, Aaron sort of, he's in quarantine now and that ends on Monday and he, I, I'm sure he's going to get tested on tomorrow. And if it comes back that he doesn't have COVID, then he will be preaching on Sunday. And he's excited. Uh, he told me he wants to preach twice and okay, well, that's, that's fine. So next week you'll get Aaron twice. Uh, but this week, uh, it's, it's going to be me twice. And so this evening, we're going to be studying from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah uh, chapter 36 and 37. That's the context that we're going to be in. So you can go ahead and open up your Bible there. And while you're turning there, I'll be in Titus. Titus chapter 2. I want to read something uh, to you. And this is what Philip read, I think, in his first sermon whenever he started off our fall focus uh, for this year. Titus chapter 2. In verse 11, it says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, here's what Jesus did, who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And so here in this verse, we see what Jesus has, has done for us. He sacrificed himself so that he could redeem us, so that he could purify us, and so that he could make us into a zealous people. And so from this verse, we see that Christians... Well, we're supposed to be zealous. We're supposed to be a zealous people. And you guys know that. I'm not, this isn't news to anyone. As Christians, we are supposed to focus on that one thing, bringing glory to our Savior, Jesus, bringing glory to him and pleasing him. That's what we are supposed to do as God's zealous people. But in this lesson, I want to look at zeal uh, from a different vantage point. I don't want to talk about our zeal this evening. I actually want to talk about God's zeal. And so if you're in Isaiah, did I say Ezekiel when we started off? Isaiah 36 and 37. If you're in that context, we're going to look at Isaiah 37 and verse 32. Isaiah 37 and verse 32. It reads, for out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so here we see that our God is a zealous God. And that's not really uh, uh, any news to anyone. We know God is a zealous God. As a matter of fact, zeal is a part of, of God's armor. And someone might be saying, what do you mean, Reuben, zeal is a part of God's armor? That's not anywhere in Ephesians chapter 6. Well, honestly, Paul is just kind of ripping off from the Old Testament prophets anyway. And Isaiah actually talks about the armor of God. And in Isaiah's version of the armor of God, God cloaks himself with zeal. And so our God is a zealous God, but we see in, in, in Isaiah 37 and verse 32 that his zeal causes him to do something. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the lesson this evening. We're going to talk about what God's zeal drives him to do. That's going to be the focus of the lesson. But before we jump into that, before we talk about what God's zeal drives him to do, uh, I need to set the scene for Isaiah 36 and 37. We're going to sort of set the scene. We're going to put uh, this verse in its context. In Isaiah 36 and 37, we see the story of Israel being surrounded by the Assyrian army. And, and when I say Israel is surrounded by the Assyrian army, I mean the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is surrounded by the, uh, by the Assyrian army. They call that being besieged. And at this point in history, Assyria is like this crazy strong nation. They are the world superpower. They are like the America of their day. And all of these other nations, the Egyptians, the, the Babylonians, and the Israelites, they're sort of suffering under the Assyrian re regime because Assyria was this wicked and oppressive nation. And as a matter of fact, at this time, at this time, the northern kingdom, had already been defeated by the Assyrians. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken into captivity, and even much of the southern kingdom, kingdom had been defeated, except for Jerusalem. And so in Isaiah chapter 36, Assyria comes knocking on Jerusalem's door. And they say, you need to give up. You need to give up. 
or else we're going to come in your city and destroy you. Don't trust in God. He can't save you. You guys need to give up. Isaiah 36, picking up in verse 13 now. Isaiah 36, verse 13. Then Rob Shockey, that's an interesting name, isn't it? Rob Shockey stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah, who was king of Jerusalem at that time, or king of Judah, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of, king, of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat uh, of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree. And each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. A land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where, of, where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Shepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that the Lord, that Jehovah, should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. So again here, Sennacherib sends this messenger to Hezekiah and the rest of the Jerusalemites. And he says, don't trust in your God. He's mocking God. Look, we've defeated many other gods before. We've overrun all of these other lands and none of those gods were able to stand up to the power and might of Assyria. And your God won't either. So just give up. If you give up, we'll be nice to you. We'll give you a lot of stuff. We'll take you to a land that's just like your own land. And so Hezekiah gets this message. And whenever he hears this, Hezekiah says, okay, well, I'm not going to listen to the, to the, to the king of Assyria. I'm going to go and inquire of the Lord. I want to see what God has to say about this. And so Hezekiah sends for Isaiah and here's what happens. Isaiah chapter 37 now, and we're going to pick up in verse five, Isaiah chapter 37 and verse five. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. And so what do we see here? We see uh, Jerusalem is surrounded by Assyria and Assyria can't get in. Jerusalem has nice walls. And they say, don't trust in God. But God says, you need to trust in me because Assyria will not breach these walls. I will protect you and I will send Assyria away. And so that's sort of the context. That's sort of what's going on in Isaiah 36 and 37. And so now let's spend some time answering the question. What does God's zeal drive him to do? And these are very foundational, very simple things, but they're things that we need to remember. So let's talk about it. What does God's zeal drive him to do? First of all, God's zeal drives him to defeat his enemies. God's zeal drove him to defeat Assyria. Uh, let's uh, jump down to verse, let's jump down to verse 33. Verse 33 of Isaiah 37. Uh, thus, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And then verse 36, this is where it starts getting interesting. It says, and the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrok, his god, Adramelech and Sharezer, his son, struck him down with the sword. And after they escaped into the land of Ararat, Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So what we see here in this context, along with all of the ridiculous names, is that God defeats Assyria. 
And this really is a big deal because, as I said earlier, Syria is an extremely powerful nation. They are the world superpower at this time, and they have surrounded Israel. And what should have happened is Israel should have lost. Israel should have just given up. Assyria should have won, but that's not what happens. Assyria loses. I mean, like, that's just... That just would have to blow the minds of, of the ancient people living at this time. I mean, it would be like America waging war with, with Cuba. And Cuba wins. What are the odds of that happening? But that's exactly what happens here with Assyria. They start off by mocking God, saying, your God can't save you. But they learn real quick that the God of Israel is not like these other gods. They learn that the God of Israel is a powerful God, able to defeat his enemies. And this is an important lesson for us, because in the same way that Assyria mocked God, we live in a world where people mock God today. As a matter of fact, it seems that the wealthier and more powerful people become in this world, the more they start to mock God and God's people. I, I mean, it's amazing how, how, how godly people can stand for the truth, and worldly people mock them. For standing for the truth. And in the midst of all of this evil, sometimes we as God's people can think to ourselves, Satan's going to win. Satan is winning this battle. And we wouldn't just outright say that, but it comes out in some of the language that we use. I mean, I've heard religious people say, you know, what's the point in teaching young people about God's plan for the sanctity of marriage? They're going to do what they want anyway. That's a lost battle. Is what some people will say. What's the point in teaching our young? They're, they're going to do what they want. It's a lost cause. And what they're really saying is Satan has won over young people. What they're really saying is Satan has won. And when we look at all of the immorality in the world, that's how we think at times. It's easy to fall down that trap. But we need to remember that God is able and going to defeat his enemies. Satan will lose. And so we need to remember that God's zeal always works out for the good of his people. I'm going to say that over and over again in the lesson, but it's true. God's zeal, if you look in scripture, every time it mentions God's zeal, it always works out for the good of his people. And that brings us to the next point. The next point, what does God's zeal drive him to do? God's zeal drives him to save his people. What we see here is that Israel was, was saved. Israel was, was, was able to go on and live their lives. They were not taken into captivity by Assyria. And again, this is a big deal because the strongest army in the world has just surrounded your city. And in that situation, you just usually end up dying. And they don't even have to enter the walls. They don't have to breach the walls. They just have to wait you out. Because in that situation, when a large army has surrounded the walls of your city, what that means is you can't bring food in or out, and you can't bring water in or out, although Hezekiah did build a tunnel for some of that. But all the, all the enemy army has to do is wait you out, wait, wait until you starve to death. And that's usually what would happen. As a matter of fact, if you look at, uh, at, at some of these stories in the Bible about how these cities were surrounded, what you'll see is sometimes the people had to do absolutely horrible things to survive. Uh, first Kings, or excuse me, second Kings actually, chapter six talks about, about how uh, Samaria, the city of Samaria was besieged. And in that, in that chapter, there's a story about two women who say, who say to one another, okay, we're going to eat my child today and your child tomorrow. So we don't starve. Horrible stuff. But that's what happens when an enemy city surrounds you. You're going to die one way or another. But that didn't happen to Jerusalem. God saved his people. Why? Well, it's because they leaned on him. They didn't turn to Assyria for help. They didn't say, okay, we're going to listen to you. We're going to trust in your power. And they didn't turn to the Egyptians for help and say, can you guys help us? They didn't turn to these other gods. They turned to God. And we see that. Isaiah 37, we're going to be in verse 14 now. Verse 14 of Isaiah 37 this is after Hezekiah has received the message from Sennacherib. Uh, Sennacherib actually sent him a, a bunch of messages. And so this is, I think, the second message that he, or, or maybe the third message that he receives from, from Sennacherib. Uh, verse 14 of Isaiah 37. 
Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands and have cast their gods in, into the fire. But they were no gods. They were the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. And so when the enemy is outside their walls, when the citizens of Jerusalem, when the king of Jerusalem is facing their, their, their worst trial, instead of turning to all of these other people, they turn to God. And that's not even the most amazing thing about Hezekiah's prayer. I mean, Hezekiah, he, he has this, this nation surrounding him. He's facing the threat of, of starvation. And he prays to God, God, please save us. And he doesn't say, please save us so that we don't starve. He doesn't say, please save us so that we can have an easy life here in the city. He says, save us because they have mocked your name. Save us so that all of these nations know that you are God. See, Hezekiah was worried about God's glory, interestingly enough. And so what does God do? Well, God saves them, right? We read about that earlier. He killed 185,000 Assyrians. God saves them. And so God's zeal drove him to save his people because they leaned on him. And that's something that, that we need to remember as well, because there are times where we feel that, that, that God won't save us because we, we're, we're too wicked. Because we have too much sin in our lives and that sin is just too big. It's too big of an obstacle for God to overcome. Sometimes we give up on God because we feel like we are too unworthy. Well, all of us are unworthy. And none of us deserve salvation. And that was true of the Israelites in Isaiah 36 and 37. They didn't deserve salvation either. But they didn't give up on God. They remained loyal and allegiant to him. And so he saved them. And that's the lesson for us. God will save his people who are loyal and allegiant to him. Like I said in the lesson this morning, our only hope is in our God. Our only hope is in our savior. And so we need to remember that God's zeal leads him to save his people. God's zeal always works out for the good of his people. And so what does God's zeal drive him to do? Drives him to defeat his enemies, save his people. One more point though. God's zeal uh, drives him to keep his promises. Uh, what, did, what did God promise King Hezekiah? Verse five of Isaiah 37. Isaiah, or actually let's start in verse six. Isaiah said to them, say to your master, thus says the Lord God, do not be afraid. Verse seven, behold, I will put a spirit in the king of Assyria so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. God promises Hezekiah, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm gonna save you. I'm gonna keep you safe. And then down in verse 30 of Isaiah 37, God says to Hezekiah, and this shall be a sign for you. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs from that. And so God tells Hezekiah, you don't have to worry about being brought into Assyria. You're going to stay in the land of, 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 of Judah. You're going to stay in Jerusalem, and you're going to eat the produce from the ground. Verse, uh, picking up in verse 30 at the end. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Verse 31. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant. And out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so God promised Hezekiah that Assyria wouldn't defeat them. They would remain in the land and they would continue to bear fruit. And what happened? That's exactly what happened, isn't it? God kept his promises because God's zeal drives him to do this. I want to look at another example. Isaiah chapter 9, turn there, please. And while you're turning there, let's think about Abraham for just a moment. You know, we talk about the three promises to Abraham. God made promises to Abraham. He said, Abraham, you're going to have 
you're going you're gonna to have this land. And this land is going to be great. It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. But you're not just going to have a land. You're going to have a, a, a nation. And a nation is going to live and thrive in that land. And he also promised Abraham, and through your seed, through your family, all the nations on earth would be blessed. Well, did God keep those promises? God brought them into the land. God gave Abraham this great family. And what about the seed promise? Isaiah chapter 9. We'll pick up in verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who's that talking about? Always the right answer. It's Jesus. That's right. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David, uh, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this uh, time forth and forevermore. And what does that last line say? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Why did God keep his promise to Abraham? It was because of his zeal. God keeps his promises. God's zeal drives him to keep his promises. And that, again, is an important lesson for us. Because our God has made promises to us, many promises, promises that we need to remember day after day after day. In John 14, Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Jesus made a promise to us that he will one day come back and bring us home. And I think of another promise, John 3 and verse 16, John says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God, through, uh, through the apostle John, promised that we as his people will one day have eternal life. And then I think of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter, sti- at chapter 6, picking up in verse 3. Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead uh, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so, again, God, through the Apostle Paul, promised that we as his people would be raised like Jesus was raised. These are promises that we need to remember. We need to anchor our lives on these promises because life gets messy sometimes. We live in a broken world, and this broken world has an impact on us. I mean, we go through discouragement, we go through loss, we go through betrayal, depression, and and so many things. And all of those things have this, this ability to sort of snuff out our fire, snuff out the zeal that we have. We need to remember God's promises in those moments. We need to remember that God has promised that, uh, that, 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 He's going to do away with this broken world and and bring us to a new creation. And in that new creation, there's going to be no discouragement or or loss or betrayal or death. We need to remember God's promises when we go through hard times. Because God has promised us something better. And our God is a zealous God. So what does that mean? That means he's going to keep his promises to us. And why do I bring this up? Because I think... Just like the Sermon on the Mount, I said it this morning, the Sermon on the Mount should fuel our zeal. I think whenever we think of of God's zeal, that should fuel our zeal as well. Whenever we remember that God's zeal always works out for the good of his people, that should fuel our zeal. And so as we go throughout this week, and as we go throughout the rest of the year, and maybe as we go through hard times, we need to remember God's zeal. It's because of God's zeal that he takes care of his people. And does that give you strength? Yeah. Yes, it does. We need to remember God's zeal. And so I'm going to close by asking, are you a child of God? I've said it a couple of times that God's zeal shouldn't have moved. God's zeal drives him to do good for his people. Are you a part of that people this morning? We read from Romans chapter six earlier. I just want to read it again. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. Do you want that? Do you want that? If so, you need to listen to what Paul said right here. We need to respond to the invitation. You can come now as we stand and as we sing.